The Biden administration recently announced a proposal to require uh, government contractors to provide what's called tr pay transparency. And as part of that objective, it also requires that these contractors not use salary history in the interview process. Um, this is now just a proposal. It isn't yet law, but uh, it is on the way. And it also mirrors the kind of patchwork of transparency laws that we've seen in about 20 other states. D.C. recently just acted its own transparency, wage transparency law. All of these laws have a similar objective, and that is to combat the equal pay problem. So historically, women on average have been paid less than men. Uh, members of minority groups have been paid less than, uh, than other groups, and it's been a very difficult thing to fix. Uh, there is the Equal Pay Act, which does make it illegal to pay somebody differently on the basis of sex alone. But that has that law has been around since the 60s and the wage gap has not closed. So this has been an effort to provide pay transparency so people know what other people are getting paid working for the same position because historically workers were not required to have that information. And in some states it was perfectly legal for an employer to fire you for even asking other employees what they made. And then as a second part of that problem, uh, particularly for women, using previous pay history to set current pay uh, has put them a step behind because often they would come into the workforce at a lower salary range and then they apply for a new job and at the new job they'd ask what you were paying what you were making at the old job and then they'd only pay you a little bit more and men were coming in you know, with a bigger advantage because they're coming in at a higher rate of pay and then building upon that so these wage transparency laws including this this one that was just announced by the Biden administration are des designed to combat those two things. So you know what the job the, the job pays, what the range is for that position, and so the employer cannot use your previous wage history to anchor what you'll be paid at the new job because you should get paid whatever that position pays as long as it lines up with your qualifications and work experience and, and other factors. So it will be interesting to see if this one becomes law. Uh, it looks like it probably will. There are some outstanding questions, particularly for government contractors. Remember, there are, there are a lot of companies that do uh, work with the federal government. Which workers will be covered by this law? Uh, it's clear that people working on government contracts uh, will be covered by the law. But will workers that you know work for the organization but don't work for government, don't work on government contracts, will they be covered? So all in all, a very positive development for workers. And it'll be interesting to see how this one actually becomes law and who it affects. The EEOC recently announced an initiative called its REACH Initiative, where it is trying to reach out to underserved populations to explain to them their employment law rights and to make it easier for them to file a charge with the EEOC if they are treated uh, unfairly in the workplace. The EEOC being the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Because a lot of these communities, particularly for like uh, migrant workers, uh, you know, people who are not native to this country, uh, people who may have a disability, A, may not even know what the EEOC, what it is, and B, may not have access, uh, easy access to filing a charge. And so this is an effort where the EEOC will go on a, a listening tour to hear what the people's needs are and to, to come up with objectives to make it easier for these populations to have access to the EEOC. This is a wonderful thing. Uh, everyone should know what the EEOC is, what its mandate is, and how to file a charge if they are mistreated. I think one issue will be, as a practical matter, the EEOC is already overworked. Uh, most people that file a charge with the EEOC, the document that you have to file in order to get your claim considered by the EEOC, in most instances, in the vast majority of instances, and this is true with our clients, the EEOC um, does not make a what's called a cause finding, does not uh, rule in favor of the employee. And in fact, what happens many times is, in fact, the vast majority of cases is you end up with your right to sue, which gives you the ability to go to federal court, which is not a bad thing, certainly. Uh, but these underserved populations probably don't have uh, easy access to attorneys. And while it's not required to have an attorney to file in court, um, it certainly helps. If you go, it's called pro se by yourself. I mean, it's, it's a very heavy lift to win in court. So as a practical matter, even if people file at the EEOC, many of them, uh, 
their claims do not, uh, they don't get any measure of justice. That's not to say it's not an important process. You have to file with the EEOC for many discrimination claims uh, in order to keep your claim alive. And the EEOC does have a mediation process. It's not mandatory, so companies are not required to participate in it, but sometimes they do. And it's possible to get cases settled at that stage. So it's not that if, if the EEOC, you know, opens its gates more broadly to these populations, which it should, it's not that there will be no justice. It'll just be interesting to see how this affects the EEOC's already very substantial caseload. And at the end of the day, you know, how much help are these folks going to get? Again, remains to be seen. I think it is a, a very wor worthwhile objective. And for employers, you probably should uh, expect once this is initiated is that there will be more charges filed. And so you want to make sure that, uh, you know, everything is clean on your end and that you're not running afoul of um, laws that the EEOC enforces.